Hi, and welcome to this new video about semantic kernel. Uh, we are starting to go deeper in how semantic kernel works. And in this particular video, I wanted you to focus on an important thing. When I'm importing my common um, common uh, utility, I have one common full DI, where DI stands for dependency injection. So this is one of the most confusing things people have when start using um, semantic kernel. So the whole .NET ecosystem works with dependency injection. It is built in in the ecosystem, and you usually use the service collection um, dependency injection mechanism is a standard made by uh, Microsoft for .NET. So when you use semantic kernel, semantic kernel is not an island, okay? It works in conjunction with everything you configure in your application. And especially when you are starting using plugin, the way you saw in the previous video, creating plugin in memory and passing the instance of the plugin into semantic kernel is not probably the preferred way for doing this. It's clear you can have your plugin resolved by the dependency injection engine, but it's much more important that all the ecosystem of semantic kernel uses the same dependency injection mechanism you have throughout your whole application. So this example is very similar to the previous one, but it has a very crucial differences. And I'm calling configure kernel builder with this new common full DI, and it returns a kernel builder object you can use for configuring the kernel. But the important thing is, let's see how this function works. In this example, I'm not using a whole ASP.NET ecosystem because I'm in a polyglot outbook. So the concept here is important. So in your .NET application, you usually have a service collection, and now I'm creating a static instance of the service collection that works only for this simple example. But in reality, you already have a service collection instance that is used to configure your dependency injection ecosystem. And this comes usually from your ASP.NET host builder. So you create a host builder, the host builder has a service collection, and you are configuring your services. For now, I'm creating a custom service collection, but the important thing is when you call create kernel builder, as in all the previous examples, you get a kernel builder object that has its own service collection. And this is bad because you will end having the primary service collection when all your object resides, and then you have the service collection of your um, semantic kernel object. So it there are situations where you want this to happen, but in the vast majority of system, you want to use the add kernel method. So using semantic kernel, when you have a service collection object, you can use the add kernel method to create a kernel builder, the usual kernel builder you used in all the previous example. But in this situation, the kernel builder is registering the object inside the main the main service collection. So you can use in your plugin everything that is registered in your application, and this is very important. If you look at the code, it is the same code as before. So it is normal code that you were using for configuring everything. And uh, we have an important uh, information here in the line 57, the service ID. And this is the very, very important thing. If you're not aware, in .NET 6, there were the introduction of CADE registration, where you can record the same service multiple times with different keys inside your service collection. This is a thing that other dependency injection mechanisms have for decades. If you use Castle Windsor, it's normal, you have the name. .NET introduced in .NET 6, but you should wait until .NET 8 to have an implementation. So in .NET 8, we start having the ability to recording in your service collection the same interface multiple times with a key. And then you can resolve that interface passing a key. I'm not going to explain all the details of this. You can find a lot of blog posts around it. And I strongly suggest you have a good grasp of how the CADE dependency works. If you look at previous example of semantic kernel where uh, we are using different large language model as an example, as you can see, I use service ID. In, in this example is it's an old example and it's it's bad. 
Okay, I should have called this uh, something like uh, GPT-40 and maybe default, okay? Uh, but this is not important. The idea is, in the previous example, when you use the kernel builder that has its own service collection, you can use the service ID. It, it's pretty much less important. Uh, but when you use an existing service collection mechanism, you usually use a service collection mechanism that has KID uh, provider. So if you do not specify the service ID null, you are actually not recording the default implementation. So when you use an existing service collection, it is much more important that the version in this time is GPT-40. The version of the services like OpenAI check complexion that you want to use as default as service ID null, because this will be used as a key service to resolve your service. And this is very important because you will not use the standard, the included, the service collection included in a kernel, semantic kernel object, in kernel object. You will use the global. So when you register your services of um, semantic kernel, you are actually registering in the global instance. So you need to have, to pay more attention because you are now part of an ecosystem. The other real important fact you have in this video, in this example, is now I'm recording the audio video plugin config. It's not an important object. Really, the audio video plugin has no need for a setting. But I want to show you that since my audio video plugin indeed has some dependency on constructor, you can benefit from a different way of uh, recording your uh, your uh, plugin. So, oh, sorry. So you need to register, you have your audio video plugin config, and then you are registered as a singleton. So you are registering in the global service collection. And then instead of creating you an instance of the plugin that you pass to a kernel object to import the plugin, you are using the kernel builder method to use the kernel build builder plugin extension configuration extension, and you can add from type and you pass the type and you pass the name of the plugin. So you are not using a real instance. You are basically telling to kernel builder and to semantic kernel, hey, you will need to use a plugin from this type. And this type, it's already registered in my, um, all the dependencies are registered in the service collection. So instead of relying on me, outside code to create a plugin and going to instantiate the plugin for you, you will do everything by yourself. And if the plugin itself has some dependencies like the audio video plugin config, all the dependency, I assure you that were already registered by external code. Now you have another key difference. Instead of having your kernel builder object to create the kernel, you now use the common resolve kernel. And if I'm going to the common full DI, if I say resolve, it uses only the service provider. So it look if the service provider is null, if the service provider was still unconstructed, it would use the service collection build service provider to provide the service provider. So the idea is service collection is where you configure your dependency injection. When you finish configure, you call the build service provider to create the object that in turn really creates your object. Now that you have this, you can have kernel object of semantic kernel registered in your dependency injection. So you can build controller that depends on kernel object, your object that depends on kernel object. So you don't need to know where do I take my semantic kernel object. You simply depend from kernel object and it gets injected in your object from dependency injection. And if the kernel of semantic kernel needs to have a plugin that in turn have dependencies, everything is going to wire together in the same dependency injection. So I can now press play and this not only create a kernel, but I use the try get plugin of the kernel because the kernel already has, should have this plugin configured. And when I do try get plugin and passing on a variable where I want to put the plugin, the idea is it always, it, it, it as the same example, as the previous example, it will create the audio video plugin. And this time all the dependency of the audio video plugin are satisfied by the standard default global dependency injection configuration.
Now, this video is becoming long, but we are almost at the end. So we can look at this. This is the same example of before. So I have the very same kernel plugin object, and we can directly invoke the plugin from code as before. As you can see, FFpeg is running and kernel is invoking my plugin. Everything working with the global dependency injection mechanism. And we reached the conclusion, and this is the longest video of the bunch, but it contains a very, very important concept. You should play nice with the, your existing dependency injection mechanism. Usually when you wrote, when you write a .NET program, you use the standard .NET mechanism given you by Microsoft, based on the service collection. And even if you are using your own library, like, um, I don't know, Castle Winds or, or everything else, Okay, uh, all these other dependency injection engines have a way and adapter to play nice with the iService collection uh, interface and semantic that you have in .NET software. So semantic kernels should play nice because instead of using the method you see in the previous video, you should use the add kernel extension of the service collection to obtain a special kernel builder object that is capable of registering everything semantic kernel needs inside the main uh, service collection object. And this allows you to register a C-sharp plugin, not giving the instance, but simply telling semantic kernel, hey, we have this type that is a plugin. And then that type will, will be um, instantiated by your dependency injection mechanism. So it can depend on everything you already registered in your software, um, API call, everything. And also if one of your object needs to depend from the kernel object, because you need maybe to call, you need the ability to call a large language model, it can simply depend by kernel object and the dependency injection will inject the kernel object inside your object for free because you are using the same global dependency injection mechanism. And this is a very important thing because this is the way you're using your kernel object in production. If you like this video, as usual, please subscribe, put a like to my video, and I waiting you for the next one of the series.